So this is episode 90 of the of the Clive Barker podcast. Uh, Thomas Nagovin is returning. Um, I think this is his second time on the podcast, but we know him a little better now, so uh, so it'll be interesting. Hey, this is Ryan. If you listen to the show, you might know that I'm a realtor in Fairbanks, Alaska. So we have this vast audience, but I only know of one of our listeners who lives in Fairbanks, Alaska. Hi, Ross. Did you know you can help me by letting me find you a realtor in your part of the country or world? I have access to networks of realtors, and many of them I know from past experience as a board president and state realtor board member. The best part is it won't cost you anything. After talking with you, I get a sense of what type of person would be a good fit for you. And when I match you together, I get paid a portion of the commission after you buy or sell a property. If you're looking to move or buying property and and, uh, you'd like me to help you find a realtor that fits your needs, feel free to contact me through the site or call me directly at 907-978-2607. Thanks. So site news, we have, I guess the the oh Tuesday tunes. So you put in the Coil Hellraiser soundtrack. Yeah, we have these features that we'll we'll try to put them as often as we can. We have some ideas. One of them is like, um, what was it called, Clive's Five or? Yeah, or Five Barker. We haven't decided yet which one. I th- I guess. Like like five yeah. things on Clive Barker, like your favorite five pinhead scenes or in this case it was the five weirdest clive barker adaptations yeah um, that you started so yeah so in the coil soundtrack i was inter- interested because i haven't i mean i've i've had opportunities to listen to it but i just hadn't gotten around to it but this time i did and it's it's pretty cool it would have been a, i think it would have been a different much different movie with that soundtrack it would have been uh maybe a little more artsy and less accessible i think that in some in some uh, ways, it would have also dated the movie a little more uh, mm-hmm. because an orchestral soundtrack is more – I think it works better for Hellraiser because it's more timeless. Yeah. And um, whereas having Coil make the soundtrack, it would definitely have dated the movie in the 80s. Um, I don't think it would have aged as well as Christopher Young's soundtrack of Hellraiser. Yeah, maybe not. It still would have been good. Maybe it wouldn't have had the same number of fans. Yeah, it's really weird. It's It's a very strange, very moody, eerie – soundtrack yeah. who knows maybe someday a fan might be able to do some kind of fan edit where they put the coil soundtrack onto the movie that'd be a interesting thing to watch <laughs> yeah yeah i mean you could kind of tell from some of the track titles where they go in the in the movie yeah there's a track called attack of the centipods and i have no idea what the <laughs> centipods are supposed to be <laughs> yeah. but there's there's like a box theme and there's a hellraiser main theme yeah very very cool very interesting yeah, very different from the what what ended up being the the Christopher Young soundtrack. Absolutely. Um, and then we have the five. Uh, we used to call it Weekly Five, and we're going to be changing the name to that so that we don't feel like we have to do one every week. But five weirdest Clive Barker adaptations. That was fun to write. You, you got you got me started because you had you were going to do that, but then you had some uh, things you had to do, so I ended up taking it off and writing on the five weirdest Clive Barker adaptations, which, of course, so- someone out there may disagree on some of the choices, but I think these are pretty solid, weird adaptations. Yeah. It was, I think, uh, uh, Underworld, which is also known as Transmutations, and then it was Rawhead Rex, and then The Yattering and Jack from Tales of the Dark Side, uh, Saint Sinner, and Dread. Those were pretty weird adaptations. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, some people li- will like some of those. I mean, there's fans... I think universally most people don't like Underworld, but Rawhead Rex has some fans. Some people like it. Who? What else? Uh, Dread. Actually, there's a there's a lot of people that like Dread also. Yeah, and, and that yeah. blows my mind. <laughs> yeah, and and Saint Sinner 
if you can get over the initial disappointment of it not being having anything to do with with the comic book mm-hmm. has some interesting ideas i don't know if i you know if i could go out and say that i like it all the way through it's got some good ideas it also has a few glaring plot holes in there <laughs> yeah like the whole you know the whole thing about oh there's a time machine yeah. uh, being kept in this monastery and Nobody ever used it, and nobody ever used it after, you know, Tomas Alcala goes back in time, and it's still there. Like, I don't even know how many years it was supposed to be, but <laughs> yeah. I mean, come on, seriously. It, yeah. It's a sci fi movie, okay? Yeah. I mean, I think that, I don't know. I think that it would have been enough just to have those demons in our world, but have to, have to drag over a, a monk from another time to fight them. That, that's like, multiple layers of suspension of disbelief that makes it difficult. I think the idea of the dagger of St. Nicodemus um, pointing towards the demons, like you put it in the ground, you spin it, and then it points towards where the demons are. Kind of a demonic compass. Yeah. I still, I'm still, i still split whether that is genius or if that is just silly. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's pretty cool. Because it's cool, the notion of something yeah. pointing towards, you know, to help Tomas Alcala on yeah. his way to find Munkar and Nikir. But at the same time, it's like, are you playing spin the bottle in the middle of the street? That thing where the demons would kill somebody by putting these straws up to them and sucking the life out of them. Yeah, that seems like something that you would have that that you would experience in a dream. But then when you wake up, you think about it. It's like, yeah, that was really scary in my dream. But when now that I've woken up, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, that does happen with dreams sometimes. You you have yeah. this idea, you start writing it down, and then. It fades away, and you start realizing that that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, and that 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 has kind of that feeling. I thought that was kind of cool just because of that. I don't know. I don't know if it works or not. I have serious yeah. problems with Dread, but, you know, some people yeah. like it. That's fine. My first viewing, I thought it was okay up until the ending, and the ending kind of made me mad. Yeah. I got disappointed just right off the bat when they started changing Stephen Grace and, and, and Quaid. And they yeah. started turning them from philosophy and English majors to video, uh, yeah. film studies, stuff like that. I'm like, I, I don't see it. And then Quaid gets naked and starts painting giant canvases. I wonder where that got that idea from. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And smokes cigars. Yeah. The writer, the screenplay writer was just doing some some choices that I think alter the story a little too much. That is going way off the mark there. Well, and you know, it's it's funny because Dread and, and Midnight Meat Train are two really similar stories because they're not big enough on their own to get adapted into a movie, right? So you look at the way they did Midnight Meat Train, there was definitely stuff added, but it was added in a really cool way that made it a good, a good movie. And, and with Dread, it feels like there's filler stuff that was added just so that uh, De, Anthony de Blasi could say this was my movie, you know, put his own kind of signature on it. Like we we discussed in one episode, the de Blasi uh, unfilmed adaptation of <laughs> of the Damnation Game, and mm-hmm. where Anthony Breer has a <laughs> he has a, a dealership <laughs> of uh, Lamborghinis, Lamborghinis, yeah, and he drives a yellow Lamborghini. I mean, I mean come on, uh, that, yeah, yeah, that was a terrible adaptation. It's man. Too, it's too you know. I guess it always happens for people that read the book. They feel this ownership over the movie when you're watching a movie. It's like, that's not right. Um, but there's some things. I mean, I mean, sometimes you can look past that stuff, and sometimes it's just it's like too much. I know. In my opinion, of course, I don't want people to think I'm not a hater. I'm not a hater of adaptations of Clive Barker's work. I mean, I love Men on Meat Train. I love Book of Blood, which some people thought, you know, oh, Book of Blood was okay. I like Book of Blood a lot. Doug Bradley is in there as well. Yeah. He appears for like a, a few seconds. If you blink, you miss him. I do have so, a soft spot for like the Yattering and Jack because it's funny. And it, the story yeah. is supposed to be funny. I just thought it was a little embarrassing. Yeah, it is. It is. And then and then you you found that quote from Clive Barker about it where, um, where he was talking about how ham, sort of hamstrung he was uh, because of censorship issues. Yeah, because on TV, of course, you know. They're not going to yeah. have a big budget, and they're not going to be able to show a cat being boiled alive inside an aquarium, or you know, yeah. a cat exploding and in the microwave, in the microwave, <laughs> yeah. and stuff like that, which really brings the the creep factor on the story. Although it's a comedic story. Well, and and I think we talked about that when we talked about the yattering and Jack a long time ago. But I don't know if it's as funny to see a cat explode in the microwave as it is to read it. 
you know, in a story. That's a good point. Go read the article. It's on the blog. It's the five weirdest Clyde Barker adaptations. Yeah, yeah, and 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 I think it's a pretty good list. And uh, and Rob uh, Rob Ridenour, he did uh, he he did an interview. He kind of it was kind of a surprise to us that he said, "Oh, by the way, I've interviewed the people who are doing the Revelations stage play in Los Angeles." So that that's up there now too. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. They talk about the, uh, the the process where they adapted the story, how Clyde Barker was uh, involved, and uh, also um, supported them during this. And uh, go read the article because it's really in depth and very detailed. The Revelation stage play took place, I think this was a one-night-only event, and it took place on January 26, 2015 at the Stella Adler Academy in Hollywood. So go read the interview, and I hope you've managed to, to get a ticket for that. Yeah, that would have been cool to see. Absolutely. Um, we did, we have a, a collector's corner that you did of your Nightbreed, your uh, boxes for the, the Nightbreed director's cut, autographed. That was that was really cool because uh, when we went to the event at the Crest Westwood afterwards, uh, we were told by by Thomas that we could we could send them our boxes and Clive would would sign them for us. So we did that. It was awesome, and uh, you also got a, a signed poster and everything. Very generous of him. Yeah, and it's kind of neat because I I, you're, I read your article and it's kind of tied in with your memories of the the Crest Westwood screening and which hopefully we'll get to talk to uh, Thomas about that today. That that was again amazing. I know we keep talking about that now every single episode, but it was really <laughs> yep. Oh, um, and then a small update update. I just wanted to say thank you to Urz uh, Urz Rohrer. Uh, he we, he sent me over two of the of the six cards that I needed for from the Imagica uh, trading card game. So now I only have four cards left to have a complete set. Uh, so thanks again to him. I sent him a whole bunch of uh, a whole bunch of uncommon cards, you know, to trade. I was looking at eBay the other day and I was trying to find the cards that you're missing, but I couldn't find anything. I have a saved search, and every once in a while, like a double starter deck shows up. Or somebody has like six cards, and they're always and they're never the ones that I'm looking for. I think the longer it goes by, the more obscure this game becomes. And one thing that I learned from from uh, Mark Miller when I was trading with him is that there's there are certain like uncommon and rare cards that were more prevalent in the United States, and then other ones that were more prevalent in the in the UK. And those four that I need are more like UK Europe ones. He he has a complete set now, but uh, you know he he just doesn't didn't have any extras of those particular cards, and I think he's since he's stopped trading. We also have a there's a review right for the Candyman Farewell to the Flesh yeah. Blu-ray from Shout Factory that's been posted. Yeah, and I know Rob was really looking forward to that Blu-ray coming out for quite a while, and then when it did, he was excited to do a review of it. So so that's up there, pretty cool. And we've talked about that movie before. That you know it's a pretty good. Uh, a pretty good sequel to, you know, to Candyman. Absolutely. It takes place in New Orleans. And I think it, it managed to wrap things up very neatly um, in, in relation to the first movie. Yep. Uh, especially if you pretend like the third movie didn't happen. Yeah. And then uh, Rob did another Tuesday Tunes um, earlier because he, he, the, the Candyman theme, which is uh, really iconic. You were listening to that. You really start to think about, you know, how different a movie that Candyman would have been without that soundtrack. Oh, your uh, and then your unboxing video for the Midnight Meat Train is up there. Uh, the feature, uh, the, something you had recorded a while ago, and you put it up uh, soon after we re- did our Midnight Meat Train episode. You know, it, it got retweeted by Dark Regions Press, and they thanked us for the uh, the video. Yeah, yeah, that, that, and we got a bunch of new Twitter followers after that happened. So that was pretty cool. If you haven't followed us on Twitter, it's at BarkerCast. Yeah. It's funny. Our our Twitter has sort of a, a son that's kind of gone on and become a lot more famous than the original, you know, than the parent. Oops, that's my phone. Because Occupy Midian has, has you know, over a thousand followers. So that was the, that was the site news. And uh, we can go on into the Clive Barker news. So the Hellraiser reunion, the Days of the Dead Hellraiser reunion, is that, that's in Atlanta, I think, right? Yep, it's in Atlanta. So Days of the Dead, um, they're having a, a sort of a, a limited edition poster to sort of commemorate their Hellraiser reunion they're doing. So that's pretty cool. People going there can get that. It says here, hot off the press and exclusive only to Days of the Dead Atlanta comes a very special run of DOTD Hellraiser reunion posters signed by none other than the master of horror himself, Clive Barker. Limited to only 100 and individually numbered by hand, creative legend Clive Barker has teamed up with Days of the Dead to produce a special run 
of personally autographed 13 by 19 inch promotional poster prints featuring the Hellraiser reunion slated for Days of the Dead Atlanta. It says here that they will be printed on high quality glossy stock and will be available for pre-order through the Days of the Dead Atlanta ticketing site for only $50 on Friday, December the 5th. It says here all of the posters will be available for pickup at the Days of the Dead show and makes a great item to have signed by the other Hellraiser guests in attendance. Oh, uh, and then, oh, there's a couple of gallery exhibitions of Clive Barker's art, uh, one of them in Oxholm Gallery in England, uh, and another in uh, the Dirty Exhibition. Yeah, the International Erotic Art Exhibition that's going to take place in uh, February 12 to 21 in, in Detroit. Detroit. Yeah, with special guest artist John Waters. Yeah, yeah so there's a lot of guests, uh, including Clive Barker, which is pretty cool. Yeah, and Clive Barker is also supplying an afterword for a Stephen King uh, book, right? Uh, he's providing yes. an afterword for Stephen King's vampire novel, Salem's Lot. Yeah. Also, uh, the first review and plot for The Scarlet Gospels has come out, and we've, we've been seeing people post pictures of their advanced reading copies yeah. of, of Scarlet Gospels. And it, it comes in like a box that looks like the Lament configuration, the paperback looks great, and it's just driving me nuts. I, I want to ask all these people, where can we get one? But yeah. if everything goes well, we might be able to give you guys an advanced review soon. Um, but yeah, but so um, the, the, the better plot summary for the Scarlet Gospels has been revealed, and um, it's on our blog. It's posted by Rob Reidenauer on January 29th. Go check it out. I know people are getting really antsy about this because they're like, I don't want to know any plot details. I'm not going to touch that. I'm not going to read it. If you don't have a problem with it, go check it out. And that, that better plot summary is from a, a review. A, like a really, I think either the first or were very one of the first reviews of Scarlet Gospels. Oh, and in the back cover of the Scarlet Gospels, apparently uh, there's a quote that says, I smell decaying flesh. Someone has been raising the dead. Yeah, kind of a nice teaser line. I hope that's a pinhead quote. <laughs> yeah, maybe so. That sounds appropriate. Yeah. Uh, Tortured Souls is available on audiobook now, which is surprising, right? Because it still hasn't come out. Uh, it still hasn't come out um, physically. Um, Midnight Meat Train you can get on Kindle now. Um, so we just our last episode was about the Dark Regions edition of Midnight Meat Train. Mm -hmm. So now that's also available on Kindle if you if you didn't uh, didn't get it or don't want to spend the the amount of money that it costs to get the physical one. Sure, there's people out there who think you know I'm not buying books anymore because you know I don't have room to put them in. Just put it on your Kindle, put it on your phone on the Kindle app or something like that. I'm sure that all the illustrations will be there. It's a very well illustrated book. So I think you'll enjoy uh, – I mean, you've seen the unboxing. You've seen how it looks like. You've heard our last episode. Yeah. And then at Fort Lauderdale, Florida, February 13th through the 15th, uh, Mark Miller and Jovanka Vukovic will be at Shock Pop Comic Con. Shop Pop. Yeah. Shop Pop. Yeah. yeah. It runs from February 13th to the 15th, and there will be some paintings from Clyde Barker on display. I think they'll be at Booth – Number 1007. Oh, there we go. So you can probably get more stuff about the Jacqueline S. movie. Maybe you can get another tote bag. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hello? Hello. Hey, how's it going? Oh, look at the <laughs> technology. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Tom. <laughs> hey. Hi, how are you? Uh, this is hey. only like the third time I've used Skype, so I forgot oh, really? that I actually had it on my phone. <laughs> it works so fine. what's going on? Well, welcome back. This is episode 90 now of the Clyde Barker podcast. Wow, congratulations. Thank you. So uh, we got to actually meet you in person at the this Nightbreed screening in Los Angeles, which was really cool. And How we, exciting was yeah. that? Yeah. Well, and we really, really Not appreciate... Not me, but the... <laughs> <laughs> no, it was. We really, and we really appreciate you um, you setting that up for us. Oh, man. I mean, the, you know, the course. inviting us, I mean. Yeah, no, I know what you mean. I mean, but it's it would be crazy to not... Yeah, it would be. I mean, that's it's just as much your thing. It's more your thing than it is even my thing. It was you weird know, to, so. to go there and sort of feel almost like a celebrity and then go back home. And like... <laughs> <laughs> but hey, Thomas, you were a great master of ceremonies. You Aww, even tricked me you. when you came out and said I wasn't backstage and, and Andrew was telling me and Bobby got knifed. I didn't know what he was talking about. What? <laughs> you don't I remember that, Ryan? No. Yes. Uh, someone, what, what was the language? Someone said, I don't remember what it was, but Furtado came in the bathroom. 
and I was washing my hands and he said something that could be misconstrued as Ann Bobby getting stabbed. Oh. oh, that's what it was. It was on screen. It was on screen in the movie. That's what it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. He said he he he, he <clears throat> ran in the bathroom and just yelled, "And Bobby just got stabbed," and then ran out. <laughs> and I was like, "What the fuck?" <laughs> and I wasn't thinking about the movie. I was. Oh, he he didn't realize that he was making a joke. He just he thought I would. Oh, like he's telling you of where in the movie that we that you they were at, so that you could yes. just get ready. To, oh, yes. okay. That's, that's what that oh, was. Wow. And, wow. and I didn't I didn't make that connection. My first thought was just like, what the what the what happened? <laughs> like that terrible He didn't say Lori just got stabbed. He said no, Ann Bobby. He said Ann just... Bobby just got <laughs> stabbed. And I was like, holy shit. That was a wonderful surprise to see Charles Hayde on stage as well. Yeah, yeah. That wasn't even announced, was it? <laughs> it was not because I he wasn't someone that any of us knew socially. Uh, and I have to thank uh, Mick Garris oh, wow. for making that introduction. He was actually the person I was most excited about. <clears throat> and as I joked about on stage, the one I kind of most dreaded, just in the sense of whenever I'd seen him on screen, he was such a cranky guy. I just didn't know what <laughs> yeah. he'd be like. But he was so sweet. He was yeah. very, very nice. A really, really nice man. And so it- I, was, I was really excited that he came. I'd remember the 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 guy who played um, Peck on Ghostbusters said that people in New York would spit on him. Oh no, I I could believe that. Yeah, I could but believe yeah, that. kind of you get that feeling, you know, if they do too good of a job being a bad guy. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Also, too, I, he's not much of an emailer, mm. and so he'd said he was going to come, but then I wasn't sure yeah and that's why we just didn't tell anybody and i thought that would if he if he shows up then it would be a great surprise well it worked uh, that was that was an awesome surprise absolutely yeah we contacted as many people as we could <clears throat> there were lots of people like uh hugh Corshi and hugh ross that of course are both in the uk and everybody sent really nice notes david cronenberg sent a really nice email so we we reached out to all the people that we could find, and that's that's who we were able to round up. I have a question for you. What is yeah. Fear This? Because I've seen a picture posted at the Century <laughs> Guild Facebook page. And in the picture, yes. there's, um, I think it's Kat and maybe Jim, and they're interviewing people at the Santa Monica Beach. This is true. For the Grand Guignol titled Fear This. So and there's a Facebook page, which we'll add to the show notes, But it's very mysterious and spooky. What can you tell us about Fear This? Uh, Fear This is, gosh, I haven't worked out any corporate answer to this. (laughs) (laughs) I guess the... uh, The mystery continues. Yeah, um, what basically happens is is so many really cool people come through Century Guild. And uh, at this point, just our, our customers and our friends and things like that, there's... There's just a lot of, you know, the, the first person who comes to mind is Grant Morrison, a really, really brilliant, brilliant human being and someone that, funnily enough, if I'm trying to figure something out, someone that I go to for their opinion. And uh, I mean, I guess if I, I'll, I'll tell you what the whole story was. I, was, I came across this photo of a, uh, a clown motel and I thought, how cool would it be <clears throat> to do like a horror themed uh, travel show. And then I thought, okay, well, first of all, you got to travel. I don't know where you would go. It's probably kind of been done to death. And then I was just thinking, you always take for granted the things that are right in front of your face. I'm like, what is it that we have that we're taking for granted? And I thought, we've got all these people that are really insightful. And of course, working as much as we do with Seraphim, the idea of kind of doing something that was horror themed, <clears throat> we just thought on a basic level, what if you just asked all these people that we knew, like the uh, the horror writers, the the directors, the people that we know mm-hmm. about phobias? We just thought we could make a really cool documentary about that. And so the thing that we're looking to do is extend it into being like a television show format and doing 13 episodes, 13 phobias. And so what we're doing is making a, like a backdoor pilot. <clears throat> so we've been filming a bunch of stuff that we're going to edit together to make uh, 
something to make a pitch out of. And so the on the street interviews are one of the segments that we've got. And then the other are people uh, like Grant Morrison is the photo that I last posted. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, like I said, I had not thought about a, an answer to that. And it's an organic format. For I now. Saw you, uh, yeah, I mean, I think we're, we're just uh, we know that we're doing it. Um, another thing that happens a lot in Hollywood that I've noticed is people love taking meetings. And I am tr- I was looking at this and, and thinking, what if we did it the opposite way? What if we just started filming and then start kind of piecing things together and just looking at all the great stuff that we pulled together? So kind of a, a little bit of this is a little bit of a social experiment in just making something. Kind of like a cut-ups technique, but on the... Uh, not even, no, I don't mean that artistically. I mean in terms of like making something just for the cool factor. Mm-hmm. Like just for the sake of who are the people that pass through the gallery? You know, will you sit down for 20 minutes and talk to me? And and then just making something without, I guess, like something that, that happens a lot. And, and, you know, this is a perfect segue to the Clive Barker stuff. You take all these meetings and then everybody talks about these great ideas. But if the financing never shows up, it never gets made. Exactly. And so I think that those meetings are what inspired me to turn around and say, what if you just made something, you know, like if someone said, well, where's it going to air? I have no idea. Like if Mm -hmm. we can't sell it, we're just going to give it out for free on YouTube. Like the whole point is just the idea of being like, you know, what if you were 15 with some video cameras and you just made something like everybody loses that. I feel like when they come out here, (laughs) it gets to be these meetings about, you know, how many millions can you get for this? And I'm looking at these budgets and looking at these conversations. And so much of it is just people get paid to take meetings. It's wasted energy, (laughs) in my opinion. It's just not, I just, so I wanted to be a little bit, try to treat it like we were teenagers. And so we've got these ridiculous people that I've been hanging out with, like Andrew Furtado. And (laughs) of course, you know, Jim, the guy that does all of our archiving is just one of the surliest human beings you'll ever meet in your life. (laughs) And he's the perfect guy to put on Santa Monica pier and interview people about what they're afraid of because he's just so dismissive. And (laughs) it's it's very funny. My experience with Jim was very pleasant. When everybody was looking into a garage full of paintings, I was just there. He was working on the computer and he was actually working on, uh, Matter Motley. Yeah. Matter Motley. Yeah. And he was just he just started explaining to me the camera, the light box, the technique, the color correction. He was just giving me the whole rundown. It was just fascinating. Yeah, that was fantastic. He's I mean, he's someone that that he was one of my best friends in Chicago and I lured him out here because the Clyde Barker work was just too much for one person. And so he was someone that I I did lure out here and and part of that is that he is absolutely one of the best human beings I've ever met. So even though I tease him about being surly, <laughs> he's a, he's a, he's an extraordinary human being. And I don't know if I would use the words kind and gentle to describe <laughs> him, but he's definitely a good person. Let's not get carried and, uh, away. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, so he's, I mean, he's a, he's a great guy and it's, it's all fun. And, you know, we're just doing it. Uh, I think, I think the other thing too is, uh, I'm trying to think of how to articulate this. I think it's just like taking advantage of the fact that I'm I'm spending so much time around these people that I really enjoy. And it's kind of like not wanting to go home at the end of the workday mm. kind of thing. And so it's like, hey, okay, we're done with this. Well, what else can we do? You know, and on some days the answer is, hey, let's grab a video camera and go to Venice Beach and get people to talk about why they're afraid of spiders. And so uh, that's kind of, I guess, how that all happened. I don't know. You is, know. is Christian involved in this too? Christian Francis? Chris, uh, let's put it this way. Everybody that you guys would think is involved is involved. <laughs> okay. It's all, I mean, it's okay. literally just, and part of it, I think actually is an extension of that night breed screening. Like we got to spend, you know, the, those of us that are, are constantly, Constantly waving the Clive banner, got to to just enjoy that beautiful event and screening. We had a dinner before that night, and um, so Mark didn't know that Christian was flying in. Oh, really? He, that was a surprise. Christian was at the theater 
when Mark got there. So Mark didn't know that Christian was coming in from London. I bet that was a surprise. Uh, he was one of the first people that we oh, saw when yeah. we got into the theater, yeah. Yeah, that was a total surprise. And so, you know, I mean, Mark and Ben and Christian and Furtado and Jim and I think that's all of us. Cool. <laughs> like, you know, just we, uh, we really, really, uh, we just, we all really love each other and really enjoy each other's company and so to quote Clyde Barker's story, there is no delight, the equal of dread. So I completely understand. <laughs> I completely understand. Uh, oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and Mick it Garris, for example, you mentioned him. He was involved with masters of horror, you know, the, the TV show. He was, you know, I, I've not met him in person. I've just had email correspondence with him, but he is so nice, yeah. super nice guy. I, I look forward to meeting him. But um, I think Ryan and I, we felt the same way, just as you were describing a, a moment ago. Once we were at Seraphim's office and looked at all that stuff, and then afterwards, you don't want to leave that house. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just don't. Yeah. It's it's a little overwhelming. We have there's a thing that we joke about, and I say we because I I fell into it too, called the hundred yard stare. And uh, Adam Jones from Tool is the is the first guy that I got to to give that stare to. <laughs> and I, he, so he came up to the house and he's going through the drawers and he's looking at all the paintings and he just reached a point where he started not really responding when I spoke and yeah. getting this yeah. glazed look. <laughs> and I was laughing. I'm like, that's what I had. And it's, uh, it's yeah. so much to take yeah. in. It's so much to take in. I got a the lot of crap time. when I came back and, and uh, I hadn't, told anybody what was in black is the devil's rainbow it's like yeah i paged through it and i and i don't remember anything in that that i saw what so let me ask you what do you think black is the devil's rainbow is well i mean it was a book of short stories and then and then a book of poems and i don't know now i have no idea okay. i that's that's what i know i thought you guys might know something i didn't no, I mean, I've, that, se I've well, seen that name and I've asked these guys like, what is this thing? And they yeah, said, I mean, when, when I saw it, know. it was like 2011. That, that was my first time out there. And yeah. uh, so back then it was a book of short stories. I know that there's something, uh, you know, these are things that are outside of anything that I'm supervising. So I'm mm -hmm. kind of speaking vaguely. I do know that Ben was editing a series of erotic short stories uh, I don't know if that's something that's on your radar yet. No. Yeah. So there is, I don't know who's publishing it, but there is a book that's in the works of erotic short stories. Uh, the only reason I was aware of it is because there was uh, a request for some line art, some erotic oh. line art. And Ben said, yeah, I need it for this short story thing I'm editing for Clive. And uh, a lot of what's happening with that is it's not that Clive is writing something new, but as you've seen, there's there's all of these things that had just kind of not been pulled together. Yeah. I found a thing up there the other day that was all, oh, my God, some beautiful, beautiful poetry. Uh, and it's just never been published, just stuff that he's never done anything with. And so a lot of what all of us are trying to do when we're up there is kind of look at some of these things and think, you know, Clive, I, I don't think, I mean, I can't speak for him, but I, I don't think he thinks about the release as much as he's just creating. And so I think that's why something like, uh, there are times on drawings, look at a drawing and on the back, there'll be some beautiful, beautiful two or three line poem. And I think he just writes it and kind of forgets about it. And so I would say more than anything, that's what, as I've observed Mark, Mark Miller, I think that's more like that's how the Scarlet Gospels was more happening is Mark looking at all of these notes and kind of wrangling Clive a little bit and saying, how do we pull this together to see this to completion? So even like right now with, you know, the fourth Aberat book and and things like that, Clive just it's almost like he uh, I'm, again, I'm not sure how to articulate. I'm much better at typing than I am <laughs> speaking. Okay. But I think I think that the way I would put it is it's almost like he um, it's like a, a fire hose. Like, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, like 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 when when Josh Boone was up there the first time for Magica and they had such a great conversation. The next time Josh came up, there was an armload of drawings and paintings 
and and it's not that Clive is thinking about what percent of what deal. He's just purely like you get him going, mm-hmm. and just the brain opens up, and it's all of this um, creative energy. And I think that's where Mark's strength is is looking at, hey, okay, all of this is great, but how do we help people experience it? And and that's something that I've noticed too, is that this this particular group, you know, you and Ben Mears and Mark Miller have have done more to get things out there and out there to the to the public, to the buying public than than what we've seen in, in you know, other other pe- seraphim people in the past. I, I mean it's definitely Mark, what I try to do is just be supportive of Mark. Mm-hmm. I will say that, I mean, we, you know, we talk constantly and there's constant brainstorming and stuff, but it's all he's, uh, if there's been any pickup or if there continues to be any pickup, it's just that with having people like me and Christian around is, uh, there's just more people kind of behind Mark kind of, kind of giving him a little more, you know, a little more fuel in the steam engine kind of thing. So mm-hmm. I would love to take credit for it, but it's really, uh, I would say that's that's Mark's strength. That's definitely Mark's strength. One of the things you used before while we were talking, and I'm going to bring it back, like pulling things together. After seeing like the boxes of notes and the boxes of manuscripts, that is a perfect description of how these books um, end up being published. It's, it's a yes. process of pulling the story together and, and honing it, and then you just release it to the public. Yeah, and, and the, the reason I was kind of uh, – I was at a loss for words a little bit is it's almost like if Clive were less productive, you would see more. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Yes. It's like how, yeah, it does. You know how Prince has those just complete – vaults filled with fully completed records yeah it's there's it's like that there's only so much that you can release and then he gets things where there's manuscripts but then they don't ever get typed in and not to make this a mark miller love fest because this is my episode but uh <laughs> <laughs> but that's what, that's what mark is so good at and then on the other hand then you've got ben who ben is like the Clive Whisperer, he, he, he's the only one that can really read all of Clive's handwriting. Oh, yeah, that would be a tough uh, job. And so that's what he's doing. That's what his day is, is he's sitting there at the computer and he's, you know, uh, transcribing that week's notes that Clive's made. And then he, uh, you know, gets them into a certain order. It's definitely, I mean, it's a, there's a lot of work that goes, like something oh, yeah. like Scarlet Gospels is a perfect example. Like there's a lot of work that, went into making that happen. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and and I think that Clive has shared so much about the process there that people were a little shocked because it, it was 4,000 handwritten pages and and uh oh and now God. the the published version is 305, right? I think that's yeah. Around that, yeah. One of the things that I I think is a perfect analogy for the way Clive works is in a magica, which we'll be getting into uh later in the episode, but in a magica gentle the main character he loses his mind and then he just gets it back gradually by doing art with chalks and writing all the landscapes that has been around and all the people that he met in his journeys and that's when the memories start coming back and once i asked uh, clive through uh, revelations if this oh my was god great, that sounds like clive <laughs> yeah and i asked him see what i mean like with his drawing if this was the same way that he let Aberat bloom out of his brain, if it was like this perfect vision, like almost Blakian. And he was like, yes, I love this question. You know, that's exactly, you just answered yourself. And I was like, oh. yeah, <laughs> yes. And, and being there at the Seraphin house and, and seeing all those manuscripts, it's like, that's the raw art. That's right there. That's the art. And then a paperback is just the art marketed, you know, translated, produced and, and edited. But yeah. art is there, the raw thing is the manuscript. Mm-hmm. But uh, moving, moving on to things that you have more control over, how is the Imaginer series of books coming along? It is, I mean, the short answer is, is fantastic. It's just kind of like a, it's a steady pace. When you say books, it makes me think of end product. What kind of the, the, the secret is maybe a little bit about the Imaginer books is that they're almost a byproduct of the rest of the process, meaning um, all of this work has to be documented, all of this work has to be archived. And in the process of doing so, we're coming up with these piles of high resolution scans and the books are a way for us to share those with people. Mm -hmm. And so literally I am 
living and breathing imaginer 10 to 12 hours a day, every day, seven days a week. So when you say, how is it coming? It's like, <laughs> oh my God, I need, I need a vacation. Whereas most people are thinking, I don't even have the second <clears throat> book yet, but it's, uh, we are, uh, the second book is, is, is in the color correction stage right now. Um, oh, wow. We're just dealing with with the wet proofs and all that kind of stuff. The intention at this point is to try to get a little bit then ahead uh, on book three. Is is so book is book two two thousand and twelve through through like fourteen or there's there's three distinct periods in Clive's art. That mm -hmm. if I if I shift away from Clive Barker fan and purely just into gallery academic mode. Sure, sure. Purely three periods. And one period is, is what we would think of when we look at the, the first edition Books of Blood covers. Mm -hmm. You could tell that he was looking at 2000 AD. He was looking at the graphic novel culture, a lot of that kind of illustrative work. And then you get to the point where he picked up the paintbrush, um, especially as, as we think of the Aberat paintings. And so there is this huge chunk of a second period that is what I think most people who think of Clive Barker's art, that's what they're thinking of. And I would say that the first section, if he had stopped there, it would be wonderful. But compared to the second part, it's almost expected. Do you know what I mean? Like you look at comic art, you draw something that, I mean, they're great mm. They're great paintings and drawings, but when he, you look at some of the ones like, um, like the Stitchlings Howl or something like that, and it's like, right. oh my God, they're just they're they're light years beyond what he did for the Books of Blood covers. And then he's got this this third period, which is after he came out of the coma, which is almost like it's the same leap again in abstraction. Um, they're a lot looser. Uh, when everyone talks about like the Lovecraftian idea of these monsters being formless, but then they draw them with tentacles. It's like we, we still try to fit things into a three-dimensional space for our brain to understand. And so there's this, all of these paintings that he's been doing recently that are, they're almost like seventh dimensional shapes. I can't even describe them. They're, they're, they're very, very strange and ridiculously sophisticated and beautiful are these full color so the, inks or uh ink drawings? some some are full color some are ink drawings like he's been um how do i describe it it's um i think that that what happens when i i, I had uh guillain barre disorder last year at the beginning of the year and was paralyzed for a couple months it was very very bizarre oh, sidetrack to my story hmm. But it gave me this insight to Clive, which is that I was so disconnected from the planet during that period that when I look at what Clive is doing now, I see the same, my limited experience, when I extrapolate that further and think, okay, you're in a coma, the parts of your brain that deal with the grocery list get completely shut down and you come back from that. Like, you know, keep in mind that all those paintings, like what you just said about the Imagica reference, if he was painting the Aberat, like trying to make sense of what he was visualizing in his, in his life, in his universe, in his subconscious, I think it's gone even beyond that now where it's almost like the language of painting is failing him to the point where it's the difference between playing someone a Beatles record and then playing them some experimental circuit music from the 1970s. Like, I just feel like he's gone. I mean, I... I'm getting off on a tangent. I'm just mm -hmm. trying to find a way to explain it. But it's just, it's very strange and very beautiful. And their faces and they're, but just like, they're not rooted in reality the same way. So I know you guys don't really edit much of this out. That's probably boring. <laughs> so no, it's I'm not at all. Like, not at all. <laughs> to bring it back. No, to no, it's, yeah, yeah. No, that's fantastic. Um, Is that the, the Imaginer books are going to be focusing on that Aberat period. They're going to okay. be focusing on 1993 through 2012. Okay. Okay. And that's and what so, the first book has on the cover. So that it's going to be more of that, that period. Uh, basically we're, we're doing something that, that is a, is a, 
a style that I picked up from turn of the century art journals, which is basically imaginer the black book is going to be one book that is like 1600 pages divided up across eight volumes. Oh, gotcha. Okay. So that's the way to look at it is that you're going to be getting these 200 page hardcovers, but when you lay it out at the end, it's going to be like a 1600 page book that covers that entire period. The reason there's no text that's that's critiques of the art or observations on specific paintings is that I don't feel like you can really do that until the entire body of work is laid out. So then you might have and, some uh, some a- analysis at at the end. I think that what I think that what I would expect would happen is that once the entire eight books are done, and this and ba- and as much of that period of Clive's life that we could possibly have documented has been documented Mm -hmm. that that's when uh, maybe some truncated version would come out. That's, you know, a hundred, 150 of the best paintings with a few different people commenting on them and making some specific relationship commentaries, but that's years away. I mean, we're, we're five years away from anything like that. And possibly even a documentary, right? Yeah. You know, Clive, had brought it up originally when we started doing the book he said i really would love to be kind of observed it, it, i think mark is the one that pointed out that he does these really peculiar and unique things like he'll paint with one hand and be writing with the other oh, God. and i don't think that he understands like no that's not normal <laughs> for, someone to, for someone to be outputting so much so quickly and so when mark told me this it was like that's crazy like that's that needs to be filmed yeah. And when uh, Mark had mentioned to Clive, you know, should we do an art documentary? And he said, you know, I just I don't like the documentaries that are just talking heads. What about maybe trying to observe part of what I do or something? And uh, we all loved the idea. But but Clive's health just hasn't really allowed for that mm. to happen. So what I try to do with with anything that I'm doing is just listen to what Clive says. Hey, I would love for this or this to happen. And then just try to be as helpful as I can in facilitating that. And so as it relates to the the documentary, there's there's just been no like we've done some things like if he's doing public events, we film him. Mm-hmm. Um, but as far as like actually him in his creative zone, uh, there has not been any anything filmed yet. With the Imaginer book, uh, the first book, are there any left still to buy? I think we've got. You know, that we, we made a thousand. I think there's like about 150 left. Mm-hmm. And uh, the clamshell editions have sold out. So both uh, volume one and volume two of the signed edition of 100 are gone. Um, but we do have some of the regular edition left. I think that if I had any complaint about the book, it would be just that the the limited release, you know, that, that we can't, that it, it, can't get out to more than a thousand people i think the number of people who are going to stick out an eight volume set uh i think that that's a small number Mm. and i think that something that's that's happened a lot with me the thing that made me think of this is there's a a series of klimt volumes that i have that document all of klimt's drawings and they only made i think 2500 or 2000 of these books and i was looking at this more as being something that was more of academic value Mm -hmm. Uh, kind of something that an art collector would be looking for, say, 10 years from now, meaning I need the entire database of Clive work, and that's kind of what that volume is. And I, I don't know. Uh, I mean, we'll see what happens. We'll see yeah. what happens. Yeah. But there's a lot of books in the world, and it's easier for us to, to make a 1,000 of something and have it kind of sell out. And, you know, and again, mm-hmm. volume one hasn't completely sold out. So it's like if yeah. we sold all of them in 30 minutes, then I would – I would agree with you, but I will also say, man, it is not fun to store books. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They take up a lot of room. <laughs> I, I do have one more minor th- complaint, I guess. Oh, come so, on. So why does the, <laughs> why does the title go go like slanty-wise down the spine I, of the book? It's not supposed to. What do you mean? It's a, is your, does your copy do that? Yeah, it, it, it goes... Um... No, I'm just kidding. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I need to... So I am going to write a blog post about this because I did have a lot of people ask that. It was very funny. It made me think of this last night because we just put new bookcases in our living room. Mm-hmm. 
and I was putting a book up and uh, there's this book on uh, constructivist design and it stands out on my shelf because it's the only one where the text on the spine is slanted. Ah. And it reminded me and it was like, it just made me laugh. I was like, oh, I wonder if I subconsciously had looked at that. But what I do when I'm doing something like design is I have a rocking chair that sits in front of the bookcase and I stare at the bookcase and I think, where do I want a book to fit? So I kind of scan and I look and I'm like, so even the size of the book, the exact size of the book is based on a 1923 edition of the Torture Garden. So the color and the shape of the book is because I looked at this book in the bookcase and I was like, this is what it needs to feel like. It needs to have this kind of thing. And then when it comes to how do you make a book stand out? I was looking at the rows of spines and I think, okay, well, you want dark and I'm imagining dark. And then this is, it's just, it's just a visual trick that it's an art deco design idea. Mm -hmm. The idea of doing the text in gold and slanted means that it's reflective and that if your eye is following an entire series of vertical lines, it's going to like ears here, higher pitches, better than low pitches. We see brighter colors better than dark colors. And if you're looking at a row of completely vertical lines and there's one that's diagonal, that's what your eye goes towards. That's really interesting. So it's completely designed to be the book. So it's a black field with a gold reflective stripe. It's meant to be the one on your bookcase. But you're not going to make to. you're not going to make volume two go in the other direction, are you? <laughs> um, all eight <laughs> covers were actually designed at the same time. OK. And so. The second spine is the same way, but then the height of the other bars actually change. But so the entire thing, whether you have the clamshell editions mm -hmm. or the regular editions, the covers were all designed before the first volume was printed. Okay. So it's all designed. To, so they'll to they'll look, look like good. A they'll art piece. They'll look good together in in a row on the shelf. Yeah. Ryan, that's the long explanation. The short explanation is that's what you get when you buy a book on Kickstarter. <laughs> no. <laughs> no but, but seriously, I, I want to talk about something which I think is very important for you too, which is these books, Imaginer, they were funded on Kickstarter. And you're trying to get another mm -hmm. book funded on Kickstarter right now that doesn't have anything to do with Clive Barker. Yes. We've actually, right after, or was it before, we, 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 we moved our publishing platform to Kickstarter. We did after, after Clive, we did David Mack. And then we, right now, we're doing Steve Diet Getty. And so the answer is yes. Instead of me elaborating, I will pause and see if there's a, a question that was attached to that. Not so much a question, but uh, an announcement here uh, that the Kickstarter for Steve Diet Getty's 25-year retrospective volume three is on Kickstarter right now. And it's got 26 yes. days to go. So I want to tell people, and we add a link to the show notes at the end of the episode. Yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah, and help you get this done because... Anyone can see on your profile that you've created 12 projects, but you've backed 92 on Kickstarter, which is quite a record. <laughs> I, uh, it's funny. I put this – I saw this thing on, on a Kickstarter that I looked at the other day, and I put it at the bottom of the Steve Getty thing. That's like, it says something about 5%, like you know, paying it forward. And uh, the first Kickstarter that I did was Jeremy Bastian, Cursed Pirate Girl. And we needed, I think, 12,000 and raised like 36,000. Wow. And the very first thing that I did was go spend money on Kickstarter. Like there was a guy making a, a movie that, funnily enough, I had read his book. Uh, it, was, it was called Fish, uh, Memoir of a, a Boy in a Man's Prison. And I had read this book and it was this beautiful, beautiful story. And he was making a short film based on his experiences. And so I found this right away and pitched in like $1,500. And so I think that, you know, this is, this is where, I don't know how sensible it is, but I, it just, it morally feels correct is that I have never been good at saving. And I think it just energetically, I feel like when, when we do something that has a great response it's, it seems like such a small thing to take fractions of that and just pay it forward. Sure. And maybe I would have paid $50 in on a Kickstarter, but if I have a great Kickstarter, then I'll go back and I'll raise that pledge to 80 bucks or 90 or something mm. like that. I just, um, I think, and I think maybe the root of it, 
too. I mean, I was kind of joking when I said not good at saving. I think that a better way to, to really articulate it is that um, I don't, this is like the opposite of Kevin O'Leary on Shark Tank. Like I don't view money as like something that you hoard. It's something mm -hmm. that enables creativity. And so when people say, hey, we're going to help you make this book, the more money we make, the more we spend on making the book. Oh yeah, you've been adding I mean, goal like, uh, project goal projects to the Kickstarter for Imaginer. Where if people hit a certain goal, you would make another book about Clyde Barker's early drawings. Oh, yeah. like the the more money we make, the less we make is the way that we're like things like that 1977 catalog that costs so much money to put together. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but at the end of it, it's it doesn't matter because everything got paid for. And so as long as it just keeps energy moving, and then if there's money left over and it goes into helping other people make creative things happen, it just it just feels right to me. And the reason I like the Kickstarter, I, I remember I was in this, uh, I was in a room with some musicians and one guy was complaining about Kickstarter and saying something about it being begging. And I, uh, I mean, you know, I'm not a wallflower. So as soon as he said that, I, I immediately got in his face just to say, let's have this conversation. Have you ever done a Kickstarter? Well, no, I would never ask for money like that. And I'm like, yeah, but that's why you're working a nine to five job and complaining about that you can't get your art made because you're not working with what the new mediums are. Yeah. And Kickstarter is a way to, to, to directly connect someone that's creative with the end user. If you pay $59 for a book like the Steve Getty books, I, if you do the math on them, or here, the Clive Barker one's a perfect example. My nephew was here in town and it was his birthday and he saw this photography book that he wanted and it was $150 and he put it back on the shelf. He's like, no, 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 no. And I was like, no, I'll buy this for you for your birthday. And he said, but that's so much money. I was like, not for an art book. Like it's, it's not uncommon. If you look in Amazon, Type in Art Nouveau and go highest price. There's all kinds of four or $500 art books. Most people just don't see them because they don't get shelved at Barnes & Noble. Exactly. But so what I love about Kickstarter is that that Clive Barker book, if that was a traditional retail book, that would be a $300 book. Oh, yeah. There's no question. Oh, yeah. Like the materials, everything that went into it. So part of why... You know, to bring it back to the point, I know I ramble, I apologize, but is that Kickstarter allows you to do things without like every bit of the money goes toward making something. There's no distributor. There's no um, middleman. Yeah, there's no there's no there's no percentages across the board. There's you're not paying a retailer to keep something on a shelf and it not selling. And I believe in supporting retailers wholeheartedly. Yeah, it's a shame when sometimes books end up like that. And they end up on a shelf or a deposit, and then the the retailer just decides, well, these books, I'm just going to call on the insurance money for them. I'm just going to scrap them, tear off the covers, and send them off to be shredded into pulp. Well, what I see happen even more than that, and this this is why I think the things like Kickstarter are important, is what I see even more than that is that the retailer just doesn't buy it. And the reason is because books on the shelf get damaged. It's easy for a retailer to sell 1995 books all day long. And for someone to have a $150 photography book, I was in a specialty store in Culver City. But for a normal retailer to have 100, 150, $200 art books, like the answer is just, you'll never see it happen. And so rather than complaining and being upset about why can't this be better? Kickstarter allows people to just do it. And maybe that comes back to even the fear of this thing is like, man, I just, I love while everybody's arguing and complaining about why things can and can't happen or shouldn't, shouldn't, I just love doing it. Sure. And then by the, and they haven't even finished their conversation. You've already got a book out. It's just a beautiful, beautiful thing. That's amazing. I've backed a few projects on Kickstarter that I'm still waiting for uh, the results. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. I mean, I, I've had some bad experiences too. But you know, I figure that that's part of people's learning curves too. And but yeah, my my house looks like a Kickstarter showroom. Well, it, it does. I mean, you know, you put more into it than you get out. But um, I just wanted to say the Steve Diet Getty. Um, I, I remember seeing a book of his back in the 90s. I think it was called uh, mm -hmm. The Beauty of Fetish. Yeah, he had two books, Beauty of Fetish and Beauty of Fetish 2. In the 90s, I, I was a lot into the Toshin art books, and I've gathered quite a few. I, I, Richard Kern, Araki. The man who edited this photography book 
was one of Tashin's editors. So a lot of the photography books that you would have seen were probably edited by this man, Eric Kroll. So that's a lot of why uh, this, this will look to a lot of people like an older, high-end Tashin type book. That's awesome, because I love those books. Yeah, no, they're fantastic. Steve Getty, was one, he, he was one of the first people to shoot Dita Von Tees. He's definitely one of the top three or four people in the world as far as fetish photography. And even more than that, he's just been a really good friend of mine for 20 years. This, you know, coming back to, to some of the Kickstarter arguments when people talk about the downsides of Kickstarter, I, don't, it's, I think it's only because they don't understand it. What's happening with Steve is he wanted to make a high-end art book. And guess what happened? One of the three or four most famous fetish photographers in the world, every publisher like Tashin, they're making really low-end books at this point. They're not willing, no one's putting out books that are $200 photo books now. That's right, yeah. <clears throat> I remember and when so they did the a transition is, to the mini Tashin books, which were soft cover. Yeah, that's where their money is. And so the thing is that what we can do with Kickstarter is we can produce a book that in a store would be a $200 beautiful fine photography book. But if you pre-order it, it's just 59 bucks because you're just paying really for cost at that point. It, it seems so, interesting uh, that we're moving, we might be moving into a world without record labels and pu book publishers and um, all these middlemen that say, hey, we'll, you know, we, you make the thing and we'll put it all out there for you and we'll decide where it sells and stuff like that. I think what I, what I would love to see is I would see middlemen earn their keep. And what I mean by that is everyone talks about the days, you know, if, if you're in our age group where it's like, oh, I used to go to this record store and this guy turned me on to this or this or the other thing. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that people have done that in a retail sense for a long time. And so what I'm hoping is that if, if the artists, the publishers, and I, I constantly, like, it's funny you mentioned records, because I buy vinyl records on Kickstarter constantly. And I think that if the artists take back the ability to create their own work, that it gets to be back to that punk rock ideology, and that hopefully there will be a new breed of retailers like Meltdown Comics in L.A. or... Uh, origami vinyl out here in LA that look at their role as being curators and that people will be willing to pay an extra dollar or two because someone's actually trying to be be the middleman instead of just what yeah. target it, you know where it's like here we're just going to set racks up but we don't tell you anything about anything and ah you're going to get me on a completely different rant about <laughs> and, yeah <laughs> <laughs> this is like you're gonna have like three minutes of good stuff. This is so long. I apologize. This is the beauty no, no, of uh, conversational podcasts. We we can go. <laughs> I think uh, Ryan wants to uh, talk about a last topic you mentioned earlier about Josh Boone working on an adaptation for Imagica, right? I I'm glad that I'm not the one that said it, but yes. Okay. He's <laughs> the one. He mentioned it on. Uh, the Kevin Smith podcast. Yeah, yeah. But yes, this, uh, he has been coming to the house. Has he said anything about who he's thinking of casting yet? Not yet. He said, I have this vision in my head of doing all these books I loved when I was young and kind of bringing them to the screen at the highest level they can be brought at because I know how it was in my head when I read them and how vivid they were. So he's, he's talking about a one-season TV miniseries. Apparently, he was doing press for uh, Fault in Our Stars. Mm -hmm. Someone from uh, a company called MRC called him and said, what do you want to do? We'll option anything you want. And he said, I want to do a Magica as a TV series. So, uh, and they said, okay. So uh, they made the deal, and he met Clive Barker a couple of weeks later. And so if we had said yes that he had talked about the cast, <laughs> you, you, would have, you would have given away some stuff to us. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I thank you for not boxing me in. <laughs> I will say that I have had limited interactions with Josh, but he is extraordinarily cool. Extraordinarily cool. Like there are just people that you meet that you're not quite sure about on different levels. And then there's people that you just meet. And it's like, man, he is just, he's just like if you or I were doing this, if we had that talent. Okay. So, so you know what I mean? Like he's, he's just a cool guy that loves the kind of stuff that we do. That's good. And I, I, 
So if, if everything works out, which I'm hoping, hoping it will, I can't imagine anybody doing a better job with this than he could. For for people out there that are really looking forward to that, though, it's going to be a little while, right? I mean, he had said that oh, he was yeah. doing a Dark Tower thing first, and then he was going to start on Imagica. Yes. I have learned a lot from the Revelations website about projects that have never been made. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that reach certain points and don't get made. And so I'm trying to not be naive about right. that things can derail. But it's hard but not to get excited. Absolutely. Clive loves him. Josh, again, the interactions I've had with him, he's really super nice, super cool. There's nothing Hollywood about him. There's nothing smarmy. There's no, I mean, he is just a fan that literally, it's just like a dream thing. It'd be like if someone gave you $10 million in Stanley Kubrick's brain and was like, what do you want to do? It was like, I'm going to make Aberat. You know what I mean? Like, whatever that is, <laughs> uh, he's like that. And I think that's awesome. And so I'm, cool. I'm cautiously optimistic. Uh, and like I said, I, I, it's not a canned quote. I think he'd knock it out of the park think he would uh it's I, I i love seeing clive excited it's a book that's very dear to a lot of people out there so uh i'm sure that you know as soon as this 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 news starts spreading more through the social media that we'll get some uh reactions from fans well and that's the perfect format for imagica too because the scariest thing in the world would be well, i mean not maybe not the scariest thing in the world but a scary thing would be somebody to try to try to make it into a two-hour movie oh yeah that would well, be tremendous I, I, you know, when uh, I've definitely met some people who have made statements that have made me turn my head a little bit sideways and be like, are we even speaking the same language? Like, you know, like, are we are we reading the same book? Like, you know, oh, things yeah. like that. Like, I, you know, I, I, I was going to try to find a funny type joke to make, but I can't think of anything except for the fact that, you know, it'd be like, you know, just someone's seeing something so differently than anyone. Uh, and I think that that's a Hollywood thing. I think that people, uh, hey, look at pandas do really well in the Midwest. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then someone says, pandas do really well in the Midwest. We need to make, uh, I don't know, Pig Blood Blues. I don't know, do you yeah. know what I mean? Like something yeah. out of nowhere, you're like, what does that have to do with anything? Put some pandas and, in. Yeah, literally, like that's, and that's what I... I'm seeing a lot of mm. out here. And so that's part of why, you know, the secret talking to you guys, that's why I'm excited about a guy like Josh Boone is because he's, he's a fan and he's, and you know, he gets it. He gets it like in the way that, that we do. There's, there's a, there's a few people like that, that we've met that I really, really like like that. And, and nothing, there's nothing in the works but just like, uh, you know, there's a company called Spectre Vision that's worth looking up. And there's a guy, Daniel Noah, that's from there that, oh, I'm hoping that he and Clive are able to figure something out. There's a uh, director, Elias Marriage, who is just one of like the, my favorite people that I've met out here. That I'm just kind of personally hoping somebody like that is able to get their mm -hmm. hands on something. But there's nothing to report and all that stuff is obviously so far away and with the magic that there's no secret like yes it's been secretly filming and it's not it's all it's all still very 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 far away it's still exciting oh god it's very exciting yeah. so people know that uh, at least people are working on this and uh, there's a possibility so let's let's see how this develops you know a lot of everything that's that's kind of circling that's the one that you know i i, I believe it will happen but then again I, you know i haven't been around this hollywood stuff there so i don't know like I talk about it with Phil and Sarah and they're like, oh, what's on the website are only the ones people hear about that. Like, I guess that there's just been a long history of stuff mm. that just doesn't ever get made. So, you know, I'm, I'm trying yeah. to be optimistic. Absolutely. Also, I'm also trying to think like if there's anything that's been happening that I can tell you that's like exciting, that'll be a good headline. I can't think of, <laughs> I can't think of anything. I think you gave us some pretty good, pretty good stuff on this episode. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I would say so. It's always a pleasure having you uh, back in the episode. Now, I, I guess we have to get Mark Miller in another episode in the future. Yes, sir. Yeah, that sounds good. Is there anything else that you've seen us, like, mention or anything or hint at? We've got a lot of exhibitions this month. Uh, there's going to be at the Danish Film Institute. 
Uh, they're yeah. doing. They're showing all of Clive's movies, including like the Forbidden and that kind of stuff. Oh. Uh, and, and then a block away is a gallery called Gallery Oxholm that's got an exhibition with like 20 of his artworks. So next weekend, Copenhagen, if you're a Clive Barker fan, holy cow, that's going to be a great place to be. That's where I would be. Oh, man, I really, <laughs> I've, I've even thought like, oh, I wish I could get out there. It's going to be really cool. They got 35 millimeter prints of uh, all the older films. They're going to show the director's cut of Nightbreed. So that's really cool. Uh, in Detroit, the Dirty Show uh, has got an incredible collection of artists, and they're going to have some Clive Barker work there. And then uh, there's a thing called Shock Pop Comic Con. Mm -hmm. Do you know about that? And, yeah, uh, Mark. We mentioned some of these events in the opening for the episode while we were waiting for you. <laughs> <laughs> there you but go. Yeah, Javanka Vukovic and uh, Mark Miller are going to be there to promote Jekyll and yeah. S. And also, I think there's going to be some paintings on display. We'll have an exhibition of paintings there, and it's basically a seraphim booth. And so in addition to the paintings, Mark and Javanka will be there. Uh, there'll be some Jekyll and S. posters that'll be exclusives for the show that they'll be signing, and Mark will have some Next Testament stuff and things like that. Is, are there any updates for Jekyll and S. That, that, that you can talk about? Not even that I can talk about. I actually okay. don't know anything. Okay. With a lot of that stuff, I don't... Um, I mean, it's really funny. Like, when you say what's going on with Imaginer, it's literally, <laughs> you know, again, 10, 10 hours of my day, I'm looking at Clyde Barker paintings, and that's really been where my most of my attention is. But with oh, Jack yeah. Linus, I, I, yeah, I'm not aware of anything. Well, I guess if people want to know stuff about that, they have to go to Pop, Shop Pop Comic Con in Florida and talk to Mark Miller <laughs> and Javanka. Yeah. Because yeah, that's, that's yeah. what they're there for. And I imagine that everybody on here is, oh, my God, your guy, Rob Reidenauer. Yeah. yeah. How awesome is he? <laughs> oh, he's he's helped us out so oh much. Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah. He's, yeah. Been, he's been very active in the blog, and he even got us uh, an interview with the people who were doing the Revelation stage play, uh, which was fantastic. We put that up on the – Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. So um, very happy to have him on the team. I mean, we really don't do a good job of, of updating as far as, like, you know, making sure that the mailings or any of that stuff really covers stuff. I was about to say people, of course, have to be following Revelations, but then I was going to say you guys have really, like, stepped up in a big way, well, and that's we try. fantastic. Yeah, well, and, and, yeah, big thanks to, to Rob for that because, I mean, with just the two of us, we – we at one point had to make a decision that we just couldn't keep up with the news and 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 in, the, in our regular lives at the same time. So yeah. So for a while, we just kind of only decided to just post our podcasts. Stuff. Oh, and and also yeah. a big big thank you to the people who handle the Clyde Barker mailing list. Uh, mailing list. I'm sorry, because uh, the mailing list is amazing. People need to sign up for that. Oh yeah. But even then, like, I mean, we you know we're doing a mailing list, but we're not. I mean, I think that what I would articulated as is that we're like Clive is, is very removed from everything and we're trying to help organize what he's creating. And so lots of things like, Oh, this uh, audio book just came out or things like that. Like, you know, we'll look at each other and see it come up on your site or Phil and Sarah's and be like, Oh shit, we forgot to mention that. Um, <laughs> that's fine. You guys are busy. You guys are, <laughs> you guys are up to your, so up that's... to your knees and like drawings and stuff. We were there. We know how it is, <laughs> but that's why we're trying to keep referring people to you guys into revelations just because, uh, you guys do a much better job of keeping everybody aware of, uh, of kind of the day to day. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank oh, and and we, we couldn't. No, it's awesome. And we couldn't do what we do without revelations. Yeah. Yeah. No, they've, everybody's been great. So yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot for this opportunity, and thanks a lot. Yeah. For oh man, thank you guys for everything that you do. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Very good. Okay, cool. Yeah, that, that was that was uh, Thomas Negobin from Century Guild, and uh, thank you very much for taking time to talk to us. And we hope to talk about Imaginer Three sometime in the future. Very soon. <laughs> All right, cool. Yeah. 
you can reach us on the web at www.cliveparkercast.com. Leave us a review on iTunes. We're on Podomatic, Xbox Music Store, TuneIn Radio, Stitcher, Double Twist, BlackBerry, and Pocket Cast. Like our page on Facebook and join the Occupy Median group. On Twitter, we're at BarkerCast and at, at Occupy Median. The forum is www.clivebarkerfans.com slash forum. Opening theme by Colin Lakativa. Thanks for sticking around all the way to the end. We've got a little bonus section here. Uh, if you've ever wondered what you're missing out on um, when we edit the episode and cut stuff out, uh, Jose put together a little compilation from uh, from this week's episode So, because uh, he edited the episode. So I, he, he showed that to me, and I thought it was really funny. So I'm putting it here on the end. Um, so enjoy. <laughs> And it, and I don't know. It just. It, I thought that was that. I, uh, um, you know, but um, yeah, uh, kind of. Um, you know, so I was like, you know, this is this is kind of like uh, opening the whole. You know, that that is not that that. Oh God. And I guess. Um. I, yeah. Yeah. It. it you know. Mhm. So yeah, um, um, you're you're yeah. So that was really cool. Yeah, 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 and 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 uh, yeah, yeah. Um, cool. No, yeah. I mean, yeah. Well, and the, the there's that it's yeah. Uh, um, uh, um, and you know. Yep. <laughs> I know what you mean. I mean, it, yeah. So. And um, so uh, yeah, by um, I st- yeah, because we are on Twitter. So if you if you yeah yeah um, you know our we, we sort of uh has but uh, all right, I already hung up the phone. Okay, that's fine by me. Are you are you okay with it? Um, I what? Well, yeah, I mean. Oh, okay. Well, never mind. I, I'll edit this and I can cut these parts out. Okay. So. Uh, so okay, so should we go into Clyde Barker News then? Um, yeah. I mean I guess I'll Oh okay. Well, I don't know whose it is then. Okay. No. Okay. Um so we can let's start from the bottom of the list because that's the oldest stuff. Um where is that one? Um Yeah. <clears throat> um I don't know the details of what you have to do to get it. So um yeah. All right, and um what was and then, uh, and then there's that, uh, the, the, the ox, <laughs> um, and, uh, uh, yeah, it, it, so it, it, you know, it, yeah, and, um, 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 